Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you, uh, Marxism, for inviting me again. This is a this is a fine conference and a much needed venue for debating the subjects that uh, are not debated in much of Australia, breaking the great Australian silence, which I'm always struck, always hangs over this country. So that's why it's so important that we're all here. Forty years ago, a book called The Greening of America caused a sensation. On the cover were these words. There is a revolution coming. It will be like revolutions it will not be like revolutions in the past. It will originate with the individual. The author was a young Harvard academic called Charles Reich. His message was that political action had failed and only culture and introspection could change the world. The way forward lay not in direct action, not in storming the barricades, but looking inward at ourselves. His message became part of a growing, insidious public relations campaign aimed at reclaiming Western capitalism from the sense of freedom inspired by the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. In other words, the individual, the self, was now the zeitgeist, driven by the forces of consumerism and the media. The search for personal co consciousness and fulfillment became a market opportunity and all but overwhelmed the spirit of social justice and internationalism. A new deity was proclaimed. The personal is the political. And many on the left began to confuse their own personal and bourgeois enlightenment as they saw it with the change and revolution for all humanity. In the West, the revival of militarism and the search for a new threat following the end of the Cold War drew strength from this confusion, from the political disorientation of those who, 20 years earlier, would have formed a vehement opposition to war and injustice. When September the 11th, 2001 happened, these people were all but silenced and co-opted into a bogus war on terror. For example, the invasion of Afghanistan in October 2001 was supported by leading feminists in the United States, where Hillary Clinton and other false tribunes of feminism made the Taliban's treatment of Afghan women the reason for attacking a stricken country and causing the deaths of thousands of innocent people. That reason was bogus, as we now know. This hijacking of progressive thought continued in the media and politics. Women were encouraged to think of themselves as liberated, at best, only in relation to men, almost never in relation to the power that rules both women and men. The angst of women seeking personal solutions and fulfillment fill newspapers and magazines. In the Democratic Party in the United States, a movement known as Emily's List encouraged the positive discrimination for women in politics, regardless of what politics they believed in. In the UK, a similar group of women MPs in the Labour Party, known as Blair's Babes, dramatically increased female representation in Parliament. Almost all of them voted for Blair's criminal invasion of Iraq. It's as if feminism has been hijacked under the noses of women and claimed by those pretending to empower women, but really containing them. In Australia, something similar has happened, as if the proud legacy of Australian feminism has been forgotten are young women told about the Australian women 
who mounted a unique campaign against conscription during the slaughter of the First World War. A poster headed the blood vote showed a defiant woman voting against war and saying she wouldn't doom a man to death. On polling day, all but one of Australia's political leaders urged a yes vote. But the nation followed the women and voted no. Such was true feminism. Thanks to Vashti Kenway and her comrades, <coughs> women and men, the courageous principled action against Max Brenner chocolates outlets in Melbourne and the violence of the Victorian police and of the state itself has been exposed. That is true feminism. Can you imagine that today <clears throat> with the anti-war movement, when the anti-war movement rather is not allowed in politics and the media to have a positive public face, male or female, that represents perhaps a true silent majority in this country. So what's happened to modern feminism? Why is so much of it apparently bereft of its political, indeed socialist roots? It seems that any woman who achieves some form of power within an immoral system is to be admired. Take the rise of Julia Gillard, the result of a macho, secretive background maneuver, Gillard as Prime Minister is lauded by feminists like Jermaine Greer, Anne Summers and others who might claim to be pioneers of the modern feminist movement. Jermaine Greer has called Gillard a man's nightmare. She didn't mention Gillard's politics. She didn't say that Gillard is a nightmare to the Aboriginal women, men and children she has belittled and blamed for their impoverishment while implementing punitive and racist measures against their communities. She didn't say Gillard is a nightmare to refugees detained behind razor wire in places where the children go mad. She didn't say how an icon like Gillard this feminist icon like Gillard, as she's been described, distorts the heritage of feminism and cripples its progress. Anne Summers praises Gillard for ending, and I quote, the cultural taboos that have kept women from combat roles in the military. In other words, Gillard's feminist distinction is that she has removed gender discrimination in combat units of the Australian Army. Thanks to her, women are now liberated to kill Afghans and others who offer no threat to Australia, just like their male colleagues, including those currently accused of killing civilians. So yes, that's another glass ceiling smashed. The right to kill, the right to engage in perpetual war, the so-called strategy dreamt up by the American general David Petraeus, now the director of the CIA, who personally briefed Gillard and whom she is said to admire. The first female Prime Minister of Australia is one of the most militaristic leaders this country has ever had, constantly promoting the Edwardian myth that the blood of war maketh young men and now women. It says something, I have to say, about the stupidity of much of Australian parliamentary politics that Gillard and her ALP cronies do not understand, it seems, that the war against terror is now a war against people within our societies. Yet regardless of her politics, many Australian women believe Gillard is, as Jermaine Greer says, remarkable and feel they should be proud of her because she's a woman. Why? I wrote about Gillard recently, and the article appeared on the ABC's The Drum website, and what was striking was that the comments were so defensive. 
with none of them honest enough to acknowledge the power game women have been drawn into, a game of consumerism and glass ceilings that has nothing to do with liberation or feminism, a game that divides gender from class. But for the truth is that what matters to those who wish to control our lives is not the gender we're born with, but the class we serve. The same truth applies to those from racial minorities who are co-opted and rewarded. Like gender, race without a sense of class is almost meaningless. When Barack Obama began his run, run for the White House, I wrote that he was merely a familiar servant of a system of corrupt power. The reaction was instructive. At a meeting of anarchists in London, yes, anarchists, I was assailed for even suggesting that the elevation of this black man was anything but a cause for celebration. It reminded me of a reaction to my interview with Nelson Mandela, in which I asked Mandela why he and the ANC had broken their sacred promise not to privatize. How could you embarrass him like that, someone said to me. I used to write a regular column for Il Manifesto, the Italian paper of the left. In 2008, my column was dropped when I warned that Barack Obama would continue the policies of the Bush years, as we now know, the years that were, sh that, as we now know, the tears that were shed on election night in 2008 were really tears of blood. Obama is as violent as George Bush ever was. And in some ways, he's worse. He sent more drones against ordinary people than any president. He's prosecuted more whistleblowers, truth tellers, than any president. He's overseen the greatest incarceration of black people in American history. His greatest achievement has been to seduce and silence the American anti-war movement. In Aboriginal Australia, we have our Barack Obamas. They're given generous space in the pages of the Murdoch press and on the screens of the ABC. When the Australian Federal Police rioted in Canberra on 26 of January, these Australian Obamas were on hand to reassure good white folks that the blackfellas had got out of hand yet again and were ungrateful yet again and would be put in their place yet again. Sexual politics have come to dominate much of the debate on the left in Western countries. It was Prime Minister Tony Blair who allowed an extraordinary free vote in Parliament one of only two in this session. The first one was a vote against fox hunting. The second was a vote, a free vote, on the, <clears throat> not on the issue of killing a million people in Iraq, but on the age of gay consent, which Blair proposed dropped from 18 to 16. Consider how the Blair government, a regime guilty of great crimes against humanity, use this issue to successfully promote, to promote itself as a friend of social justice. And where were the persistent political voices in the activist gay community that revealed this cynicism? I can think of one, Peter Tatchell, an Australian. In Australia, where are the voices that refute this kind of manipulation? This is the cover article <clears throat> on the good weekend which came with this morning's age um, newspaper. Some of you may have seen it. It's, uh, the cover is meant to be uh, designed, I suppose, to be very clever, very titillating. It's about the problems that gay people have some gay people have in the Arab community. It was quite clear that the writer, who was really heading for the Muslim community, ran into a bit of a problem. 
because he found that a number of Arab people are actually Christians as well. Uh, but the point of this manipulative piece was that was to demonize stereotypes of Arab people in Australia and demonize them on behalf of the issue of that many, many gay people quite rightly stand up for, and that is freedom. And that's something that I think we need to address from within the communities and from without them. On same-sex marriage, the issue seems clear to me if two people want to marry each other, why shouldn't they, regardless of their gender? Why should the state or the church or anybody stand in their way? I'm for same-sex marriage. But if we go to the barricades over this issue, to the exclusion of so much else, let us first examine the institutions of marriage and its relationship to property rights, to capitalism itself. Let us think about the emphasis we place on bourgeois acceptability, on abiding by society's rules, rather than, as Oscar Wilde put it, understanding that man's greatest virtue is his disobedience. I'd like to leave this question with you. Have we not lost a sense of proportion? Last week, Professor Will Steffen of the ANU Climate Change Institute warned that we are fast approaching the time when it will be too late to reverse our willful heating of the earth, perhaps the greatest crime of all. This is our issue, your issue. It's a people's issue, like war and poverty and injustice. In other words, if we want to change the world, if we want to save it from ruthless, violent power, our priorities should be clear. We must not look inward, but outward. Or we betray all those who don't have a voice. Thank you.